Beverly, how are you? Hello, that was fine. I'm sorry I missed the session, but I, I'm taking a Ro Roman history course at the University of Chicago, and I had to leave that course to come here. So anyway. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, uh, Beverly, based on, um, uh, uh, as you discuss about the Roman, I've been in, uh, in, in Bath. This is, it's a city in London, uh, in the UK, and there are a Roman bath there, and there are the origin, uh, the origin of the Roman bath. It was amazing. I visited this city uh, two weeks ago. It was really amazing city. Yes. You need to visit this one. I I hope to someday. <laughs> okay. 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 But we're ready for the next session. Then I Go think ahead. we are. Go ahead. Oh yes. And uh, we have three interesting people, and I'm really looking forward to listen to what they're going to say. The first individual I see that, is it Mariam or Mario? Yes. Yes. Uh, is here. And, yes. Um, with sixsuccess.com, is that correct? Yes, uh, and with their group, the three uh, presenters is from one uh, organization. Hi, Miriam. How are you? Nice to meeting you. Hi, nice to meet you again. Thank I you so fun. much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, now, are you you in Irvine, California? Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. And me and Hossein, my co-founder, will present this uh, session. Oh, okay. That is perfectly fine. Hello, everyone. Would uh, you like to go ahead? Yes, you, yes. Can you, can can you hear me okay? Yes, you can share your screen. Absolutely. Just give me one moment. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, uh, let me take the opportunity to thanks everyone for, uh, for this amazing uh, uh, series. I find myself uh, among the amazing crowd that, uh, you know, we can collaborate and learn from. Uh, my name is Hossein uh, Tutunshi, but uh, the name is not showing correct. Let me put my LinkedIn here um, for folks to have access to that. Uh, so my name is actually Hossein. I don't know if I can put it in the chat or not. I think the chat is disabled, right? Oh, it's here. My bad. No, it's not disabled. Uh, all right, so sounds good. Uh, my name is uh, Hossein Tutunchi. I am the co-founder of a company called uh, Six Success with Mariam. Uh, we, Six Success is a is an online incubation center that uh, we established um, about four years ago. Share my screen. <clears throat> Let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so. We started this uh, incubation center uh, specifically to help first-time founders uh, use their startup idea and immigrate to other countries such as Canada. So uh, there are uh, certain countries uh, in the world that, that are growing that are actually promoting um, technology and a startup to attract the top talent and uh, if you will, build the next Silicon Valley. One of them is um, is Canada, and it's uh, it's been it's been an amazing ride uh, for us to help uh, founders from all around the globe to apply through this program and uh, actually make their dreams come true. But with that said, we soon realized that there are other. Um, complexities and intricacies that comes with building a startup in a foreign country. So sometimes you build a, a startup where you live, you have a network, you have resources, you know the language, um, and that's challenging. But also sometimes you need to build a startup on the other side of the globe. And, you know, with the resources you don't know, but you have to rely on the network that you work with and the network that can support you. And also education becomes quickly a problem because uh, what you learn and you might learn it in a different way or different setting in the other side of the globe might not be applicable to the destination country. So in the past four years, we had the pleasure of consulting uh, 
over 200 startups uh, to go through that incubation center to land in Canada. And uh, we learned that the traditional, let's see if I can, yep. So we learned that the traditional methods uh, of launching a startups, you know, uh, lean a startup, agile, and all of that uh, are not really applicable to all sorts of first-time founders. Because, uh, for example, we had doctors, we had surgeons with 20 years of experience. They were experts in the, in, the, in what they do, but now they wanted to launch in a startup and they didn't know the way, They um, the education part, the traditional education that you have to go through in order to understand the lingo, the you know uh, requirements is actually taking a lot of time. Um, so again, me and Mariam are, are the founders of this startup. And uh, we realized that in order to help mass, um, uh, basically, a uh, group of founders, new group of founders that are not trained in the traditional way, they're not expert or, or uh, they're not aware of the traditional language of a startup, if you wanted to help them um, and they're first-time founders, you need to develop a more versatile, more flexible uh, framework in order to help them catch up. And uh, we realized that the existing frameworks lack that uh, versatility or this, uh, this flexibility that they need. For example, uh, first-time founders, they do not have a pre-existing data or experience. So when we help a founder to go through the uh, incubation center or someone who has access to books or uh, other resources, at least they have the pre-existing knowledge. But they're first-time founders that are coming from other countries, other settings, they do not have necessarily that knowledge uh, uh, obtained. And there is a barrier that actually prevents the success of a startup, even if the idea is really good or the market is ready. Uh, the other one is the rapid technological advancements. So not long, long ago, like two weeks ago, uh, for example, OpenAI introduced new wave of you know uh, AI agents that you could actually build without training, without uh, the need for training or programming or technical knowledge. And that right away not only killed a lot of startups, it also killed or eradicated sort of uh, markets, uh, such as you know copywriting is currently being affected. Uh, 1.5 billion dollar you know uh, annual market is being affected by this, and uh, that shows that the traditional ways of going you know learning startups and coming and build something is might not be really applicable with new advancements uh, in the horizon. And also adaptation of the remote and hybrid uh, work environments. Uh, we used to kind of sit down together in an office, talk, collaborate, but with uh, recent, you know, COVID and other uh, limitations, now people are actually embracing remote hy hybrid work, uh, working with different time zones, and that's a challenge that might not be for, uh, might not have been seen in the traditional uh, uh, frameworks. So over the years um, and through a lot of practice, we realized that if we wanted to maximize the chance of uh, success for a startup, uh, for first specific first-time founders, um, we can actually walk them through this stage, six six uh, stage framework that we developed and it reiterated over two hundred startups, and that starts by you know always ideation and problem validation mentorship, MVP, which includes build, test, and learn, and uh, product market fit, sales and growth, and funding. So if we help startups sequentially to go through these stages and uh, basically build what they're doing and learn what they're doing while they're building the product, it's the most effective method with short amount of time. And uh, sometimes, the, for example, I give you uh, uh, an example about the funding. Like a lot of startups think that going, you know, funding is a success, right? It's a milestone that they need to get funded. 
Uh, however, with new metrics and new actually startups growing with available technologies, uh, not a lot of startups will need funding in order to you know reach uh, uh, the scalability they need and the sales they need. And it's going to challenge the traditional way of growing and VC uh, funding that as we know it. Um, so over the years, we came up with a framework, uh, this six stage framework that combines different small, small and different tasks at the different stages, like the categories that we understand it. And uh, this is available here. So we developed these kind of like a small task in different in this six stage framework that we assign to a startups and mentor them uh, at each stage one by one to complete. And uh, this will help them to shorten the amount of time that they need to go to market and also reduce the cost of development and launch. And uh, I'm going to share that template with you in order to kind of uh, share the knowledge and learn your uh, from your experience as well in order to optimize this framework. Um, so uh, going back to this, we uh, tested this over 200 startups since 2018 uh, that we helped them to land in Canada and start a business. And uh, we kind of like followed the metrics that are important for the industry. And uh, for example, first year in the market, second in the market, like the startups that didn't die, um, after one year, that's that we set up as a milestone. And then uh, we search for the basically industry uh, benchmarks that are available. And we realize that um, we are getting almost this amount of percentages, like an average 10% from one to 10% uh, of increased in uh, different values that we've been following on these uh, startups. And that showed us that uh, it's really working versus a traditional uh, kind of like methods uh, and functions available. Uh, but we also set an interesting challenge for ourselves. So we know that this data is actually uh, working for uh, first-time founders, right? People that are not traditionally a start of founders, but are learning to kind of like build a company, build an idea and bring it to market. But we want to test that if this is something that we can do or improve our workflow with uh, for serial entrepreneurs, people who have built a startup before, people who have been using traditional way of building a startups. And uh, with that, we started by ourselves. It's a work in progress, but um, we are building uh, the first uh, large language model for immigration. So basically, uh, we're building and training a very accurate recommender system that as you set up an account on arrive.global, that's our uh, new startup, you set up an account, you answer some basically eligibility questions and uh, let the AI recommend all global visas to you. So the AI will understand your skills, your interests, your capabilities based on the questions that you answer. And it will search global visa spectrum and visa, uh, and global mobility options for you and then recommend them, uh, uh, you know, which, which routes, which visas you can apply for. And uh, the beauty of this is that you can select multiple visas at the same time. And then the next step comes in that the AI, because it's customized, it understands you, it knows your preferences, it knows your intricacies, it will create all the documents uh, that you need for your immigration route tailored to you. Um, I give you an example. Let's say uh, you, you're going to immigrate through uh, Canada uh, startup visa. And as a part of that, government requires you to write business plan, to have resumes, to have market research. And the AI, because it understands your business, it asks some uh, qualifying questions, it will write a comprehensive tailored business plan for you that fits in uh, with your role and your co-founder's role uh, into the startup. So uh, it's going to be actually helping people find new routes uh, for their global mobility. And we're launching it for uh, individual B2Bs and enterprises. Um, in next two months. And I highly recommend if you find this interesting, 
please visit our website and uh, sign up uh, for waitlist. Uh, so we once we launch, you have access to all that information. And uh, like I said, it's a work in progress, but we uh, actually um, set up two routes for building this. We ask um, a traditional kind of like way of building this a startup. How much does it cost? The time to market and everything else. And uh, also we consulted a external uh, development and consulting agency to be our partner to kind of do it on the side and let us uh, give us the report of the cost and time to market that they predicted. And also we ourselves uh, are building the mark, uh, building the product and launching it and comparing the results. So, so far the traditional cost uh, estimate that we got from uh, actually four developers and agencies is uh, somewhere between $350,000 to $400,000 to build this um, technology in order to work and you know generate uh, the revenue. And uh, for us, we're, we've spent uh, so far around $37,000 and we expect to finish this by $50,000 uh, as, as expected, like, uh, like I said. And also the time to market, uh, the traditional uh, way is about, which is like agile combined with uh, different teams is uh, about one and a half years, but we're on par to finish this uh, almost like in five to six months. So that uh, right away showed that this method could be uh, beneficial to startups and founders who have built startups in the past, uh, but uh, we're testing that and hopefully we find uh, better ways to even improve it. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm ready for the questions. No, we will save the questions until the end when we all have presented, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, yes, sounds we good. We'll so, do that. Yeah, that that's the... was a wonderful presentation. Thank Is, you. Uh, Thank you so much. Did, did the six success, the six come from the six steps you have? I'm curious for the name. Correct. Correct. <laughs> uh, so we've been testing that for a while, and then uh, we decided once we have enough of data, uh, we're going to actually name... Uh, that based on this and the success stage, we're going to improve it over time and uh, basically stick to it. So yeah, that's uh, that's the name. <laughs> okay, very good. Our next speaker is um, with the has a Age of Learning Incorporated, and it's Alizera. Uh, and I, you're pronouncing your last name. I'm not sure. Would you please pronounce it for me? Sure, Beverly. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, so yeah, my name is Ali Reza Bolucci, and I'm with Age of Learning, and I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm very interested to hear what the Age of Learning has to offer. So it's up to you. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I, I kind of like, I'm going through uh, what the experience, I'm putting Age of Learning as a case study for the experience that I had. And also uh, I, I wanted to thank Mariam and and, uh, and Six Success for having the great presentation, which is actually leading to what I have. So what I'm going to talk about today is navigating the growth journey from a startup to enterprise. So what I do with organizations, I, I join them when they are a, a more established startup and help them to go to the next level, which is a part that is usually getting missed. So uh, just a little tad about myself. Uh, I did uh, my background is computer science. I did my PhD uh, in that major, and I've been serving as head of the center of excellence at Age of Learning for the last couple of years. Uh, and I've been helping a startups uh, for the last five, six years as an advisor, as an executive. So moving on to the next slide. So what I'm going to focus on today is going to be a scaling in an organizational leadership. So we had a great presentation about idea to launch and a little bit getting into growth. So I'm going to continue that with how to get from growth to expansion and establishment. 35% of the startups, when they reach series A, funding, they fail before getting series B. 
And there are reasons around it. And that's where I, I helped Age of Learning. Of course, like Age of Learning was a little bit more established than that, but I think the lessons learned can be held for the rest of the organizations. So when we are growing, there are a number of challenges and milestones coming our way. One is delegation. Uh, when we say delegation, I've been working with CEOs and executives in different companies, large and small. I've worked with Visa, JP Morgan Chase, and a couple of startups, early stage and established. A problem that is exists for managers, founders, executives is delegation. I've seen CEOs coming in and want to say their opinion about the color of a button on a page. We have UX designers who can do that. So that delegation is a big part of it. The other one is trust. I'm going to talk about this in more detail, just touching on them. When we are a startup, trust is there because I found my co-founder. I know them. I've been building trust over my life. Now I started a business. When we are growing, I hire someone and I need to build that trust. Process change. As we grow, we cannot run like a startup anymore. Culture maintenance, we want to stay like a startup but culturally so that we can survive in the current ever-changing environment. Uh, agility, so that I'm always open to respond to change really fast with minimum cost and market adaption. Of course, with the new generative AI, we see the market adaption is really important for every single company out there. So let's dive in a little bit more. So how do we evolve the structure of an organization? So I was in a startup. I was, we were a number of co-founders. We had some early uh, employees and we were working together and like, you know, traditionally set in a garage, but now it's remote, but we talk with each other every day. Now we need, to, we are expanding. We need to look at our organization like a system. Every piece of this system need to work with each other. So we need to find out how to build it. Dependency is the killer for every single organization. That's essentially one of the main reasons that the legacy organizations, that's what I call them, the larger organizations, they cannot respond to change really fast. They are very heavy. And the reason for that is the dependency. So what we do, we are going to create to clear that dependency and I explain how we did it at age of learning. Also find a way to bring autonomy to your team. So each team is autonomous and they can make decisions, act on it really fast and move forward. That's the way that you bring that the startup culture that you had into every single team. So each team is now like a startup. It, it looks really easy. It's one of the hardest things to change because people don't let it go. They cannot delegate. They don't trust the teams. So that's something I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Sustaining culture and communication. So uh, I, I saw someone mentioned lean and maximizing the amount of work not done and essentially maximizing by minimizing. Focus on an essential task. When we are a startup, Everyone talks about MVP. Essentially, now everyone knows MVP. They know that they need to focus on essential tasks. As teams grow, we need to put that in the DNA of every single person in our organization. And a lot of the startups fail just because of that. Because people think, or your employees think, they are doing a favor to you to do more polish and do extra. They don't know if you have a prioritization, they might want to leave that, go to the next one. Every single organization will work on something, build it, and they find out it's not working and they want to put it in like, you know, in trash to start something else. So if you polish it, you're wasting your time and the time of the, the resources of that organization. So preserve the sense of your early communication style. Early days, I pick up my phone. If I'm on this, in the same room, I go to my co-founder, talk to them. Uh, we, we pick up phone, we call each other, we respond, we send a text message. The next text message comes back in a matter of seconds and minutes. When we are an organization, a larger organization, I'm sure if you've ever worked in a corporate world, you send an email, two days later, no response another email, then the VP and like directors are involved and like, you know, getting that result. Solve that problem. 
So as you grow, you need to build a communication way in the DNA of your organization. The next one is recognize the trust factors. Uh, so as I said, the trust when we are building a team is essentially there. You don't need to build it. I go and find people who I trust to build a foundation, but then I hire new people. How to build that trust? Uh, if you know Bob Gallen, one of the most uh, accomplished um, agile coaches, I, I had him for one of our teams to do a training on leadership. He was saying, extend trust till it hurts. So when we are working as a team, we should trust each other as much as we can and build a way to increase that trust over time. And one last thing is, Acknowledge the challenge of pivoting in later stages. When you're a startup, when you're in early, early stage, pre-seed or seeds even, changing and pivoting is, are much easier. As you grow, you're more invested. It's like playing poker. If you play poker, as you stay more, the risk is more, the commitment is more, and getting out is much harder. So mentally and resource-wise, you should be ready to know when to pivot and when you grow as an organization in series A and B, it's much harder to do it. So you build up your organization to be able to do that. So let's talk about Age of Learning a little bit. Age of Learning uh, was founded about 12 years ago. It's been successfully helping uh, everyone to, to educate the world. So that's our mission. We want to educate the world. The focus is right now on kids and we are trying to help them learn as fast as possible. So over 30 million children finished over 6.8 billion act educational activities over the years that Age of Learning have been working. What, uh, what we did to become more and more successful over the last couple of years, uh, some insights I want to share with you. So we focus on building a system, not a headcount. Indeed, we are and we are we were we are less number, we have less number of headcount than a couple of years ago, and we are growing faster. And that's because we built up a system. We empower the teams with autonomy and self-management. So how did we do that? We looked at the value streams, if you are familiar with that term. We looked at all the things that we do in the organization and the results, we separate them out as they are the independent products. We built our departments around those value streams. And then we had service departments, marketing, data analysis. But what we did is we said, your department are servicing, so you're coaching and mentoring, but we deploy people from your team inside each team. So each department can make their decision exactly on their own. So we built, and within each department, we help each team to be able to autonomously make decisions and push it through. So um, we, we pushed for prior for adaptability and continuous improvement, the recent changes in AI, full power using all of that within every single piece of the organizations. And the way that we did it is we build up the center of excellence, that we train and coach teams and constantly aware of whatever is going on inside the organization and outside. The bottom line is find the bottleneck and the bottleneck your organization. Do that, go to the next bottleneck, and that's how we build up an organization. But we should do it consistently every day, and everybody in the organization should think about it in your organization. Oh, the last slide is about AI makes it much easier. With the recent changes, everything generative AI can help with a lot of things in process. And also, I've been helping a company named Catchup to build up a, a management tool that automates, modernize, and decentralized management for the teams. So that way you can build up a team that has all these cultures within themselves and put it in their uh, DNA. So you can scan the QR code to access the website. And now a call for action. Please go and think how you can help your organization to get one step more toward self-organizing and being an autonomous organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, let's see, do we have our third speaker here? Uh, Mehdi 
Shokui. Shokui? Yes, Shokui. Yes, I'm here. Oh, well, uh, my goodness. Well, you, that is not what your... Uh, How are you doing? It says Marion. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Mehdi Shokui. So do you want to start? Uh, yes, Mary? why don't you go ahead and start, and then we'll have time for discussion at the end of your presentation with all awesome. three. Awesome. So first of all, thank you, Beverly, for the uh, opportunity, and Dr. Hanadi uh, for amazing uh, conference that you built. And thank you, Maryam and Six Success team for inviting me for this uh, uh, conference. So currently I'm in uh, Germany, Dusseldorf. I, I was lecture, speaking at a speech at Medica conference. It's one of the biggest healthcare uh, conference in, in Europe. Uh, so I have, I tried my best to uh, present, uh, provide one of my uh, presentation that I already presented in one of the lecture before. I'm trying to share my screen, but for some reason, you should be able to. So hopefully everything goes well this time. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So sorry for this uh, technical challenge. So my name is Mehdi Shukui. Uh, I have a, a PhD from University of uh, Medicine uh, in, uh, in the medical design and AI. Uh, in last uh, couple of years, uh, we had three successful startups uh, in the AI industry uh, that we had an opportunity to have a successful exit uh, in, in the healthcare, in the, the HR, human resource, and uh, logistics using the AI. So in this uh, session, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the impact of the AI and, uh, and entrepreneurship in the history and uh, what has uh, I have been uh, using so far and what are uh, I see a uh, huge potential in the future. So, uh, so as you know, the, the AI just started like in last uh, couple of years and the beginning of the, the history started in 1930. So I'm going to go over about the, uh, go over the AI, the history of the AI, the development that happened in in these years, and how is uh, how AI is uh, uh, challenging the organization and changes in the organization, and how uh, so far we had uh, close to 300 uh, unicorn startup like they valued over one billion, and how they used AI to get uh, to this point. So as you all uh, may know that AI. Uh, is a is a machine ability to mimic human action and, and there are so many activities that has been done uh, the the basic of the ai is all about artificial intelligence machine learning and computing power and uh, our, uh the uh, ai itself it has different subgroups of uh, ai machine learning and deep learning that uh, they all uh, you saw in the daily uses that like AI has been used in self-driving car and they are using in the face recognition and these days and it's a buzz of chat GPT and uh, using the NLP. So in general, we have four types of uh, AI. So uh, we, it's the evolution of the AI in the history, reactive machines, limited memory, theory of mind, and self-aware, which is like they call, and they call it a uh, super AI that uh, people are trying to uh, completely uh, uh, like the, all the uh, decision-making of the human can be happened by machine. So AI can be used uh, in the different fields like robotic, uh, expert system, speech, machine learning, generative AI, planning and optimization, and, uh, and NPL, uh, and natural language and processing. So in the companies that uh, I've, I've uh, started uh, in the healthcare, we use the vision and robotic. In the, the human resourcing, we use the planning and optimization and generative AI. And in the recent one, we are using the speech. So the opportunity and challenges of the AI, so it, it autom automate all the routine tasks, improve decision-making and personalized, personalized services. And as Hussein mentioned about the, the arrival dot, uh, er, and the, the new startup that they have, they are trying to optimize the, the administration and work by uh, providing uh, really 
uh, organized way and serve the customer. Uh, the risk of the AI at the moment that there is all this challenge in, at the government level that and this, it's all about data protection, the privacy, ethics and accountability. And, and there's a talk about job displacement. So in, in a close future, we are not going to have the current job that we have. These are all this stuff that happens in the AI. And when the AI happens here, what's the role of the entrepreneurs? Uh, what uh, they can do to create more jobs? So let's look at the development of the AI in this year. So look, uh, if you uh, look at the history of the AI, it's almost started in 1930s and we had a, so much uh, uh, development in the decades till now. And the buzz of this year uh, and last year, it's, it was all about the chat GBT, uh, the system that they can answer our question and they can we can uh, have a conversation with them. When we, uh, when we talk about the in industrial revolution, we know that first industrial revolution happened uh, the, when the steam power uh, uh, started in the 18th centuries. And now we see that uh, in, then we had the electro uh, electricity, then we had IT and uh, dot-com bubble, then we have Internet of the Things, and now we are talking about the AI and how the system and machine can think like the human. So when, when we talk about the AI, there's a stage of development for AI. And we as an entrepreneur, we need to understand how uh, we need to consider these stages. In the AI community, we are talking about like weak AI, strong AI, and super intelligence, which is artificial super, uh, super intelligence. That, that means the, the full control of the machine that, that they can think like human. The works that some people like Elon Musk that they try to do with the Neuralink that they uh, implement the sensors in the brain. AI can help to uh, think, to uh, uh, retrieve the information from past, edit the information in your brain. These are all about the super intelligence that can, and that can happen and we are not there yet, but uh, based on all the research that's happening, there's a huge chance that we can get there. At the moment in 2023, we are all about talking about the weak AI, all the chat GPT that uh, is happening right now, there's all weak AI. It's not uh, human-like cognitive, uh, it's not human-like cognitive, and they don't have human-like cognitive capabilities. They are getting there but it, it's all they have their own errors. So let's talk about the AI and the growth market that happens in last years. And based on this information, I, I want to talk and connect the AI to the entrepreneurship and how founders and new founders, they create a new startup to uh, ride this wave to create the unicorn company. So in 2022, over, uh, we had the investment over 165, $165 billion and 52% of the companies uh, uh, invested 5% uh, of their budget in the AI, artificial in intelligence in their business activity. 16% of the big corporation and enterprise uh, value, they, they increased in the enterprise value of the private AI companies between 2021 to 2022. And as I mentioned, so far uh, till now, we had over 350 startup uh, company that their valuation is uh, over $1 million, uh, technically unicorn company. So when, when we look at the AI ad uh, uh, adaptation, so since this is the conference, international conference, uh, I try to focus on a different region. And uh, we are talking about the adaptation of the uh, AI and exploration of the AI. So in the different reg region, China, they had a lot of investment to adopt, uh, to, to have the AI adaptation. Following uh, China, India, uh, US, uh, and other countries, they try to adopt AI in their system, in their uh, country, and in their all the IT facility that they have. So right now we have a buzz of ChatGPT. I'm sure that everyone uh, heard about that. What is the uh, ChatGPT? So I'm just gonna move uh, fast on these slides. So uh, these are the the capability of the ChatGPT as generative uh, AI. 
uh, they have large scale training, uh, they have uh, contextual understanding, they have API based deployment, personalization, and multiple use cases. So technically, you put input, uh, the system gives you output, and there's uh, some uh, tuning based on the information that you have for the AI. Technically, you can and talk with the machine, and the machine can give you the answer. So this is the working with the ChatGPT. Currently, ChatGPT, uh, they can answer the question, translate, automate tasks, different tasks from like making presentation at the uh, basic level, and you can integrate the uh, like this system to customer service, chatbot for the websites, uh, simple survey. So this is the current uh, uh, situation that we ha we have uh, for ChatGPT. So when we when we talk about the AI in an organization. So this is the current stat that uh, IBM Global uh, uh, re, uh, AI Adaptation Report uh, reported uh, uh, last year that 35% of the uh, companies they use AI, 66% uh, and they are they have intention to use it. 54% of the companies surve uh, surveyed are already saving time and money by using AI. And 48% of the company surveyed report better customer experience with, with uh, AI. So this is these are the top uh, categories, eight top eight categories that uh, these are the AI as a helpful tool, application of the AI. They they use in the customer service, call center, business processes, supply chain management, uh, like uh, Amazon, quality management, accounting, sales, marketing, and HR management. And these are the top, uh, 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 the most uh, common appli uh, application based on the McKinsey research uh, that uh, that uh, report that uh, the main things that AI can cover is uh, mainly the administrative work of different uh, sector from healthcare, from reading the uh, radiograph to uh, speech to text ability, to uh, this is the healthcare situation to like other sector also they are targeting the uh, automating the administrative work so this is uh, like um, the use case and uh, what ai capabilities uh, uh, capabilities are companies deploying different uh, things uh, it's just summarized here and what's going on by uh, as an entrepreneur, we need to look at what are the challenges when ad we are adopting uh, AI in the big organization. What we are observing is lack of AI skill and limited knowledge uh, impede successful adaptation. So when we are uh, targeting the organization that they have over 20,000 employees, 30,000 employees, and when uh, the employees they uh, used to they knew how to use the google search they knew how to use the office powerpoint there is a delay and gap to adopt uh, to uh, teach and train uh, employees to use ai system the adopting ai at the moment has a high cost uh, there is inadequate tools and platform in all organization there is a complex project high data complexity and the confidence so high cost, as uh, Hossein uh, mentioned, for the new venture that they have, just simple integration and cost for like half a million, just for the like the the showing the minimal viable uh, product. So this is the AI maturity uh, uh, in companies. Level three is company. There are company like DeepBrain and Google. Level zero is non-automated companies. So uh, uh, companies like uh, Subway that, and, and, or uh, you name it all, and there are so many uh, company out there that they, they're, they, they, they're not using AI yet. So there are, uh, when, we are when we are using the AI, there's a, as you know, there's a cycle for doing that. And there's a, so many iteration to train and the model for the AI to make sure that it's a really good fit for, for that organization. And typically this uh, process takes a lot of time. And uh, there are so many prerequisites for introduction for the big organization. 
uh, to implement uh, AI uh, from weakness in the process, solid uh, in infrastructure as a basis, volume of data, data cleaning, linking data and process and em uh, employee involvement. All this process is one of the big investment for the big organization that they are in, in the market so far. And as a founder, new founder, these are the biggest opportunity that people are trying to help out big ent enterprise to integrate AI technology in, in their system. So uh, these are like talking about uh, the competencies that uh, we need to have in the big organization. And uh, in terms of the entrepreneurship and the creating job in the AI, I would like to uh, talk about uh, what are the, the, the high uh, valuable startup that we noticed in last couple of years and how they start up companies and they become unicorn. Yeah, so, three minutes. Sure, it's, uh, it's going to be done in three minutes. Uh, one of the, the process was the customer service. They use the AI for the chatbot request. The, and other areas of the application that we see that uh, startup and entrepreneurs and they are creating uh, companies is AI in the healthcare uh, for reading the images, for reading the videos, for uh, simplifying the text for doctors. Uh, these are all the uh, opportunities that exist. Then we have AI in retail sector. Amazon is one of the pioneers that they are doing that and that are improving the process. We have AI in energy supply and close to 30 of these startup companies that are uh, focusing in energy. AI in the service sector, this is another opportunity that uh, people are doing a lot, the business process, call center, and also AI in, in, in manufacturing, Amazon and other companies that are using robots and AI technology for doing that. And AI in quality management is uh, one of the, the big uh, opportunity for entrepreneurs to find the unique ideas to start their own startup company and AI in supply chain management. So the whole aim of this presentation, I wanted to cover uh, the, the connection between AI and entrepreneurship and how I, uh, personally use uh, these concepts in last uh, three startups that uh, we sold uh, in the healthcare, HR, and logistic. With that, I try to finish my presentation in 20 minutes. <laughs> Very good. You only had 15 and I gave you a couple extra. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and if you'll close the uh, screen share, Sure. Thank you. So we can all go. So uh, I had a just a couple of questions. I, I always try to integrate the three presentations, and I've this has been quite a challenge to figure out uh, something that applies to all three simultaneously. Uh, the first one, I, first question I had was the idea that one of the things that you said uh, in the first presentation that it was primarily aimed at new founders. And then you mentioned that it was, you were applying it to serial entrepreneurs. Uh, approximately, are there more new founders of uh, enterprises than serial entrepreneurs? I know an awful lot of serial entrepreneurs. That's why I was curious. Uh, well, uh, based on, this is, Based on observation, I don't have yeah. any data, right? But I think with new technologies such as large language models like chat GPTs and everything becoming so mainstream and easy to use, I think the number of first-time founders is going to skyrocket. Like it's the barrier to entry is so low right now. And even it becomes even easier. Like in a couple of weeks from now, uh, people can build their own large language models release it, earn income. And that requires no coding at all. And I think it boils down to how innovative the idea, the business model would become, right? The next frontier of companies, the billion dollar unicorns, I believe are not those that 
rely on technology that much because the technology is being the foundation is being built solidified and released right even for example uh large language models available right now i give you an example like falcon falcon is like chat gpt it's equivalent to chat gpt uh 3.5 and it is free to use right you can use it yourself to build the technology so it will eliminate the millions of dollars funding needed for a startup to go through and build such technology so i believe yes the number of um the number of first time founders would would surpass the you know serial entrepreneurs that are into it um, and also people that are building startups before they're committed to do something right now they're busy and the chance of pivoting uh it would be less than somebody is starting it with new, you know, advancements. And I think that learning how to do it goes along with our second presentation, which was learning. And uh, one of the things you focused on um, scaling up, but what about new founders like the first presentation? How does how does your what you're offering go with them? So um, uh, I think new founders that are having a like tricky life now. Uh, like it was interesting. Our CEO was attending the Dev Day on OpenAI just last week, and he was saying like people were sitting there, and as they announced, their the startup died right away because like over the last year, a lot of startups started like creating a wrap around OpenAI. And then all of a sudden, OpenAI did everything themselves, creating, introducing, customized GPTs, and they just died. So it's very tricky to find out what I'm doing is using it as a tool, not as a product. And uh, that's going to be very, very hard to challenge. So I am expecting a lot of new founders come into play, but a new like startups like die right away. Yeah. Uh, what I think, what I said is important to them is consider that lean startup mindset. I've been talking with a lot of new founders and they don't know their MVP should be very simple, just focusing on the most important thing to be done rather than building everything before testing it. So that's the main issue with every single founder I talked over the last year with. Like they, they, they just can't, can't let it go that let go of the important, the non-important stuff and focus on the most important one is the hardest mind play that they need to like, you know, work with. Yes, it's a, AI is a transformative technology. There's no question about it. I was just reading that whereas coding used to be something that we said everyone should go into, but now you don't need to learn coding. You don't need that. Uh, so many of the That's things... They were talking about computer science is now go not going to be the major to go to that it was before because things are changing so rapidly now when you look at it. And when you look at the, as I said, the transformative uh, technologies is one of the things that when you look at it, I don't think that we have even a full appreciation yet of how much this is going to impact our entire, shall I say, society, because I, I, I want to expand it beyond just businesses and the impact it's going to have on the future. I, I don't think we have a feel yet as to how much of an impact it is going to have in the future. Um, and when you look at the... Uh, you talked about AI and the different things it has. There was a 2022 article that did a research on AI uh, academic articles, and they said that they'd come up with 15 different definitions of what it was because it goes in so many different directions and it has so many different things. And I was wondering if one of the things in your presentation that it concerns me is funding and the expense of it, because the amount of power and energy taken for many of these AI applications is really putting a strain on power grids. Yeah. So 
So the, the cost, um, it might be a little bit high, but uh, the beauty of the AI at the moment, as Ali Reza and Hussein mentioned, if you want as an entrepreneur, you need to always look at the ROI, what's the return on your investment. So if you find a really niche problem that can make money out of that, when the revenue is higher than your investment, definitely mm -hmm. those costs is really minimal. And you can cover all those stuff. As a simple fact is if you can take any like burden from doctors, the saving the money and saving money that you have from doctors is gonna be billion dollars. And the amount of the money that you need to invest for the, the technology is just a couple hundred thousand or million dollars. So technically, when we, we when we look at the, the big picture, the high level ROI. The cost that we still need uh, for those investments, it's really minimal. Okay. okay. Do we have any questions for the audience? Anyone? I just want to make sure that everyone, would you like to ask each other questions? I have a question uh, from uh, Hossein uh, regarding okay. the. So yes. it's really interesting uh, uh, platform that they build, and this is one of the big uh, like challenges uh, for the immigration system all around the world, mm -hmm. especially uh, for such a, a great international conference that we are talking about. Or uh, a lot of people that are living outside of Australia, US. Canada. So what is the uh, future of this platform? How do you envision that people they're going to use it and how they're going to make their life easier? And what is your uh, like revenue model? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Mary John, for asking this question. Um, well, first of all, we envision this product to be helping uh, primarily individuals to find the best uh, route for their immigration and minimizing the cost as much as possible. In some instances, we're helping people immigrate through this platform for free. Mm -hmm. And something that's currently costing uh, you know, $5,000, $2,000 through a traditional way, we can do it in $50 hundred dollars because we're embracing AI to do all the heavy work for us and then leave the final decision to the user or lawyer. Um, I envision that uh, in future, because of the immigration is going to be embraced more and more, a lot of people are trying to uh, immigrate and find new opportunities, especially after COVID. Uh, I think governments are also going to look at this uh, in a way that this is a system that how they can utilize to improve their processes. You know, they're notorious for lengthy kind of waiting time. Um, and I think it could be used for that. This direction, not only our, it might be our company arrived, but, but other, you know, players also emerge that will play a role for sure. Uh, but I think the direction would allow users to uh, allow governments to think about it. And also regarding the revenue model that you ask, uh, like I said, we're trying to make it free or very low cost for individuals. Then we have a model for immigration consultants and lawyers. And uh, that's also going to be a revolutionary uh, market uh, or actually revenue model. We're going to charge per case. And uh, it's going to be very minimal, like one to $2 per case. So we're helping you to actually make more money um, by, you know, utilizing the technology and minimizing the cost as much as possible. Uh, and also we're going to introduce actually a, a, a innovative network of a network effect in our product that lawyers could bring in new customers and actually benefit from other lawyers income as well as a pool. Uh, so we'll be introducing that in coming months. And uh, ultimately, we have enterprise version, which will help incubators 
to onboard the startups at larger scale and uh, basically help them to complete this journey of a startup and uh, growth, uh, you know, faster with less cost. Uh, well, Ali had to leave. He has another meeting at two o'clock. <laughs>